Hello and welcome. I'd like to welcome you to our Making a Business Case for Long Duration webinar. My name is Maria Malwenda and I am the digital series producer and your host for today's webinar. Um, of course, I'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Clean Horizon, EDF, and NEC. This panel is part of a wider series organized by Solar Media. You might know us from our online publications such as PD Tech, Energy Storage News, Current News, and Solar Power Portal. To see our full portfolio, subscribe for, to our free publications, and register for our other online summits, please visit solarmedia.co.uk. Before we begin, I have to go through a few uh, housekeeping notes. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the special training session hosted by Clean Horizon, which will be held on Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. British summer time. This is, we'll look at the European regulations for storage, and it is essential for anyone trying to tap into the European market. Don't forget to log into the Meet Me Zone this week. This is the best place to meet other participants, new partners, and future suppliers. During this session, make sure to post your questions to our speakers on the questions tab so that they may be answered at the very end of the session. So now I'd like to welcome our moderator. Dr. Imri Gyuk, who will be moderating the session. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, it's a pleasure to be moderating this, this session. And uh, well, as everything else, we are going digital. And we have three speakers, myself, uh, Russ Weed, and Matt Harper. And uh, Russ, will you introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Imra. Uh, I'll be the third speaker, but glad to introduce myself here. Uh, Russ Weed, Chief Development Officer for Aries Advanced Real Energy Storage. It's a gravity storage company. Uh, as the name indicates, it's rail-based. I'll look forward to showing you some uh, uh, demonstrations and uh, projects that illustrate the use of rail energy storage for long duration. Okay, okay. Matt. Yeah, thanks, Rustin. Uh, my name is Matt Harper. I'm Chief Commercial Officer with Infinity Energy Systems. Um, uh, my Infinity makes Infinity makes a technology and product called vanadium flow battery, um, which is which is in our view useful for the kind of long duration applications that we're going to be talking about today. Um, my background is originally as a, a mechanical and systems engineer. Um, I've been doing uh, technology development and commercialization in clean and renewable technologies for about 20 years now. Um, my role with Infinity is primarily related to commercialization of the technology. How do we make sure that uh, the products that we're building are serving real problems on the electric grid today? And then how do we make sure that we're getting those out in front of our customers and, and so that they're solving real, real problems and, and making real money? Well, thank you. Uh, and I will introduce myself uh, as I start my slides. Maria. Okay, I am Imre Duke, and I direct the Energy Storage Research Program at the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity. And I've done this for quite a while. Uh, about 20 years, in fact, long enough to see a real evolution of energy storage, evolving from the very beginning uh, to uh, one of the hottest topics in the energy business. Now, I said energy business. That means that as we introduce new technologies, we have to introduce business cases. A business case balances cost and value. For energy storage, uh, the cost comes, first of all, from the storage system itself, but a substantial part of the cost comes from other things, uh, the power electronics in particular, 
but uh, also the facility itself, the balance of plant. Uh, you have to remember that a storage plant has to sit on property. It has to have a building. It will have air conditioning. It will have fire suppression. Uh, all of those things uh, are expensive. And of course, they're building uh, inspectors and fire inspectors and lawyers and the cost of money itself. The value uh, comes in two parts uh, and they come in multiple benefits. We are on the one hand talking about well-defined values such as arbitrage, uh, demand charges, frequency regulation, but also we have to take into account unmonetized values such as resiliency. So what we are doing uh, in our office uh, of electricity uh, and in fact what we are all doing in this industry is to build and validate business cases which then respond to uh, requirements such as resilience, sustainability, grid stability, etc. Now I will take a few examples uh, that are also historical development. In fact, the very first business case that showed commercial viability was frequency regulation. And frequency regulation uh, needs only about 15 minutes of storage. Uh, we did the very first prototype uh, jointly with NYSERDA and CEC, uh, in fact, two experiments simultaneously, uh, and we did it with a uh, 100 kilowatt installation. And we showed that, in fact, uh, this works very well. You can use storage for frequency regulation. And moreover, the value of doing this, uh, you get twice as much frequency regulation for a given amount of uh, energy uh, than you get out of doing it with fossil fuel uh, changes uh, by themselves. Uh, we then built this example into a uh, an actual full 20 megawatt installation. And at this point, uh, since we have had demonstrated the value of the new technologies, FERC uh, stepped into the picture and they established pay for performance. From then on, uh, you wouldn't just pay for capacity, but you would get paid for actual performance. So 15 minutes and it required regulatory action in order to make the technology commercially viable. Skipping ahead a couple of years, uh, here's another example. Uh, Sterling, Massachusetts. We built, a, uh, we built a storage microgrid there together with the municipality of uh, Sterling. And uh, it was built very fast. Uh, it took only three months from the uh, uh, original uh, start to the ribbon cutting. And from the first day on, the benefits became apparent. Now, here is the rundown of how the benefits worked over the first year. Uh, you notice that we had arbitrage, we had monthly peaks, uh, demand charges, and we had annual peaks. Uh, for a total of about 400k uh, uh, a year in avoided charges. Now also notice that the arbitrage is the smallest one of them. It really re rests on demand charges. Uh, but it works very well that way. For a capital cost of $2.7 million, we had a $1 million return after the first two and a half years. And the graph shows how the monthly and yearly uh, demand charges add up to substantial amounts. Now, the storage involved there is two hours, and the regulatory structure uh, comes from uh, in this case, ISO New England. 
Now we go to another case uh, where the storage duration was eight hours. And this was on Nantucket Island, also in Massachusetts, uh, and National Grid had this project. And Pacific Northwest Laboratory uh, did the analytics of the situation to establish the business case. Uh, what happened there was that there are two underwater lines servicing Nantucket Islands. Over time, uh, the amount of electricity coming through these lines, at least for the peak values, uh, was insufficient. And it was contemplated uh, building a third underwater line, which is a very expensive proposition. So it was suggested that energy storage could do this just as easily. And uh, as the calculation shows, uh, using energy storage to satisfy the peaks uh, is much better as a business case. Uh, a six megawatt storage unit was introduced uh, for eight hours. Uh, together with six to 10 megawatts of a diesel generator uh, to yield the required 91 megawatt peaking capacity. Ribbon cutting was last October and the return on investment is 1.55, which is quite good. Uh, in fact, the deferral value was 110 million and the operational benefits were 36 millions. And this is the installation on the upper left-hand corner and the happy ribbon cutting on the lower right-hand corner. Now, as we went from uh, these business cases of longer and longer duration, uh, we noticed that every step towards long duration storage also requires uh, new business cases, and these have to be based on appropriate regulatory frameworks. Uh, it has to be allowed by the PUC, it has to be evaluated uh, in a new way, which has to be uh, grounded in a regulatory framework. Now, as it is going at the moment, projects are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, here, example, uh, Southern California Ed Edison. Uh, within about a year, by August 2021, uh, they intend to put about, six, se about 700 megawatt of new storage on the ground. Now, we notice that uh, most of these are together with PV. That's the essential feature. Uh, all of them are four hours. All of them are lithium ion. Well, to really uh, work with PV, we will eventually need longer duration storage than four hours. Four hours uh, gets us through the uh, dispatchability problem the uh, outages that you get through clouds and what have you, but it doesn't get us uh, into the fundamental problem of the fact that the sun doesn't shine at night. Well, chances are that lithium is going to be sticking at four hours, eight hours, maybe even 10 hours being done in Australia. But we are not totally happy with the incumbent lithium ion. There are sourcing, sourcing problems, there are ecological problems, little boys uh, grubbling up cobalt in Africa, uh, sociological issues. There are safety and reliability issues, which are still there. Uh, Arizona found out to their detriment. And above all, there are problems about reuse, recycling, and disposal. Uh, unlike some other technologies, uh, 
disposal and recycling is a very difficult issue for lithium ion. Perhaps not insurmountable, but difficult. Well, nonetheless, uh, energy storage has become a resounding success. And this is the prediction for the next uh, five years or so. Uh, I should mention that this is already out of date. Uh, the numbers are really 40% higher. And all of this is essentially predicated on lithium ion as a technology. So if we want to have longer duration, uh, we may have to go into different technologies. In fact, we most certainly will. We have to realize that 30 states, Washington DC and three territories have already adopted renewable portfolio standards. Seven states in one territory has in fact set renewable energy goals. If we're going to get to situations where a substantial amount of our energy budget comes from wind or solar, uh, we will need longer duration storage. We have to talk about eight hours, 12 hours, days, and uh, perhaps even seasons. To get started on this, uh, DOE has done a days program for long duration storage. Uh, the California Energy Commission has had a solicitation for long duration, long duration storage behind the meter and uh, other technologies such as uh, flow batteries uh, have responded to these uh, investigations. So looking at the current technologies, uh, what kind of cost goals do we have? Because if we're going to have longer duration storage, it's got to be a lot cheaper than what we are dealing with at the moment. Lithium ion, of course, uh, does go down and uh, for the cells only, or for the packs only, we can expect about $100 per kilowatt hours. Now, of course, the actual uh, cost of the uh, full units is going to be more because uh, after all, it has to be an installation, not just a battery. Flow batteries, vanadium flow, uh, we've brought the cost down to $300 per kilowatt hours. Maybe one can do it lower. Uh, zinc manganese is a candidate, could be as low as $50 per kilowatt hour. Uh, low temperature sodium is being considered as perhaps $60 per kilowatt hour. Aqueous soluble organics is something in the future of, for flow batteries, could be 125 and of course, advanced lead acid is still waiting in the wings. It's fully recyclable uh, and could be as low as $35 per kilowatt hour. So what's on the horizon? First of all, electrochemical. We might get better lithium, uh, lithium that's more cost effective and perhaps more recyclable. Uh, we have other technologies such as AMBRI, sodium uh, by NGK, uh, solid state uh, systems, uh, FORM is promising us uh, very long duration at very low cost. And flow batteries, of course, uh, vanadium redox, zinc bromine, zinc manganese, iron chlorine, uh, many different systems are available. Then we can get, we could get to gravity storage. Well, we can stack up cement blocks. It's been tried and uh, it, it's an ingenious solution. Uh, the question is how much can you rely on the technology of cranes? Or else uh, you can put it on rail, uh, rail cars and you could do your gravity going up uh, inclines there's a project uh, coming up in Nevada that you will hear uh, hear about uh, later on uh, today. Uh, 
Pumped hydro, still there. Uh, mostly they are now uh, closed cycle systems, uh, but uh, there are new possibilities, all underground systems, for example. Uh, but the, even though at the moment 95% of the storage is in fact pumped hydro, uh, it's difficult to site new pumped hydro. Compressed air, an excellent technology that was developed to go along with nuclear energy. Uh, but unfortunately, there are only two major projects uh, in the world, and we're waiting for others to come online. Uh, cryogenic pro uh, storage, uh, using liquid air, for example, uh, is a possibility. Liquid air, of course, is a highly developed commercial technology, uh, and using it for energy storage might be an interesting uh, industrial solution. Thermal systems, well, ice and water uh, have uh, high uh, energy content, uh, but, uh, and they're also uh, ecologically very acceptable, but more ingenious um, uh, technologies such as Estes and Mal Malta uh, may become available. Uh, vehicle to grid could be a long duration storage too, at least for 12 hours or so, but it's really only applicable to fleets such as school buses, the postal fleet or military fleets. And then we have chemical storage. We can make hydrogen and ammonia and store it as such. Uh, we could store it almost indefinitely. So it's attractive. Uh, but what is less attractive is that uh, you lose a lot of energy and a lot of uh, uh, dollars when you uh, do all the transformations. And finally, you could do hybrid storage systems uh, where you use electrochemical storage plus fossil fuel uh, to take care of uh, the ends of the, uh, of, of the of the demand uh, in case, uh, let's say, rare events uh, are covered. Uh, you could use your fossil fuel stores. So those are some of the technologies which could be considered. And we will hear uh, of two approaches uh, later on, uh, one of them being uh, flow batteries and one of them being gravity storage. Long duration energy storage uh, is really es essential for the development uh, towards using renewables on the grid in massive amounts uh, going over 50%. So to get a greener on, and more reliable grid, we do need long duration storage. But this will require a new regulatory framework, mandates, what have you, uh, because the cost will have to be covered in a well-regulated way. And that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you very much. And we go on to uh, Matt Harper uh, on flow batteries. Thanks very much, everyone. So, um, pardon me, give me a hit here. All right, uh, so I'm Matt Harper with uh, Invinity Energy Systems. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, our vanadium flow battery solutions and how we figure those solutions will fit into a future um, long duration and high renewables uh, grid. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background about who we are, talk about our view on, you know, what we really mean by long duration. Um, talk about what long duration means today, talk about what we think long duration will mean in 2030, and then, you know, see if we can extract some lessons out of that future view of our electric grid to inform what we should be doing right now in terms of developing storage and deploying storage out into the field. 
So uh, first of all, I already gave a quick introduction. Um, you know, I was one of the founders at Avalon Battery, which is one of the companies that merged back in April to to form Infinity. Um, you know, as chief commercial officer, my role is to um, essentially make sure that we're building the right product and then getting that product out in the right customer's hands. Um, I, I do come from a technical background. Um, I started my career do, with about 10 years in uh, 10 years of work in fuel cells and uh, hydrogen generation and storage um, before moving into the flow battery industry back in uh, 2005. Um, uh, you know, I've, uh, through that time, I was working with a couple of different different pioneering companies in uh, in flow batteries, including VRB Power Systems and, and Prudent Energy. Um, and like I say, through the merger between Avalon and Red T. Um, I, I've ended up as, as CCO here at, uh, at Infinity. Um, who is Infinity? Well, uh, Infinity, as I said, was formed by the merger of Avalon and Red T uh, back in April. You know, we were two of the pioneering companies in flow batteries uh, around the world. And, and by going through this merger, we've created the leading flow battery company uh, globally. Um, our Vanadium flow batteries are deployed around the world, uh, helping businesses, utilities, um, you know, various parts of industry make money off of energy storage. Um, our products are commercially proven. Uh, you know, they are in revenue service all around the world. Uh, they are cost competitive with a lot of the uh, incumbents that we see in the market today. Um, as, as Matt Pace was telling us about in the previous session, they are comparatively safe and non-flammable. These batteries are as likely to put out a fire as start one. And especially, you know, in the sort of high density uh, urban environments, like you see in the picture from Los Angeles at the bottom left, that safety is absolutely critical. Um, they are fully recyclable. The, I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the vanadium uh, electrolyte in our battery in a minute. But you know that material is is infinitely usable. It can be used uh, for hundreds of years. It doesn't degrade. Once you take that material out of the battery, the rest of it could literally be recycled in your uh, curbside recycling bin at, at at your home. These are it's made of very very standard, very widely available materials. Finally, the the cornerstone, especially when we talk about long duration storage, is that this is an extremely durable technology. Uh, you know the the technology itself doesn't degrade. Um, it doesn't have the same degradation mechanisms that you see in a conventional battery. And because of that, you know, we're deploying these alongside solar projects in particular, uh, you know, in a way where the battery will be installed and operating for the lifetime of the solar install, which is typically on the order of somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Um, based on those, you know, on those characteristics, you know, we think that these are a great fit for those long duration applications we're talking about, delivering low cost, low carbon power. Um, and, uh, and we've got a uh, little north of 10 uh, megawatt hours installed to date. Uh, the company itself is publicly traded. We're listed on the London AIM board um, on particular IES. So um, the gents uh, that I'm on the panel with very rightly pointed out in my first draft of the presentation, I forgot to say, talk anything about what a flow battery is. So here's what a flow battery is. Um, you know, essentially, as, as compared to the conventional battery technology, where both the energy and the power uh, handling capabilities are built into an individual cell, we separate those two things out from one another. We store the energy in our battery in a liquid, hence why it's a flow battery. If you look at the image in the middle, you see that there are a couple of big blue tanks inside one of these modules. It's those tanks that hold the liquid where the energy is stored. The cell stacks, which are the red things you see up at the top, are the devices that convert that energy into power. You know, do that electrochemical conversion to actually, to actually generate power that is useful outside of the, the battery itself. Um, the rest of what you see in here are really support systems, pumps to circulate the liquids, um, power electronics to you know, convert into the kind of voltages that uh, are used by standard inverters. And all of that is tied together inside a single unitized building block. The thing that Infinity is, uh, that Avalon before and Infinity now has really focused on is turning into that, turning it, taking that flow battery technology and turning it into something that is a 100% totally turnkey product. These devices are tested at our factory before they ever leave the plant. They are 100% fully functionally complete before they ever land on site. And what that means is that instead of, you know, a lot of conventional flow battery projects that could take months to years to, you know, construct and build and integrate on site, we can deliver one of these things off the back of the truck and have it up and operating inside hours. 
And especially, you know, in, as we look at pairing these technologies with, uh, with, um, with solar production, that speed of delivery is something that we view as absolutely critical. What it also allows us to do is it allows us to look at the products we've got operating in the field and get a very, very high level of certainty about how they're performing and how they will perform in the future. As it stands today, we've got over 160 of these absolutely identical modules installed and operating in commercial applications in the field. The data flow that we get back in from those is second to none in terms of the ability uh, to, to, to look at a fleet of identical flow batteries, understand how they're really operating, and optimize their performance so that we can be absolutely sure they are going to deliver that value every day of the year for the 25 years that they're going to be installed. People always say, well, you know, this is a, you know, they look at these things and the, the device you see on the left hand side is about two meters wide, a meter deep, two meters tall. And they start to say, ah, oh, well, that's, you know, it's very small. You know, what are you going to do with that? Well, we use it as a building block for, you know, a, a modular and scalable architecture. Um, we take those individual battery modules and sometimes we deploy those to, say, commercial and industrial sites that have a comparatively small electricity load they're trying to regulate. We aggregate those things together, what we call our battery packs, which are sort of, you know, containery looking modules that can be pre-configured, shipped around to the world and still have that, you know, very sort of rapid deployment kind of aspect associated with them. And then ultimately what we do is we take those and build those into a, uh, you know, a cluster of, 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 of modules that are going to operate together. So, you know, by, by having that kind of scalable architecture, we're able to um, you know, serve a lot of different applications using that same standardized, very repeatable form factor. So, the topic the, on the topic of conversation today. So, what is what is what is long duration? Well, you know, our view is that long duration isn't. It's not. It's not defined by technology. It's not a. You know, there is no. There is no. Lo, lo, when you say long duration storage, it's not. Uh, you know, oh well, those are flow batteries, or oh well, those are. Uh, you know, gravity fed things. You know, long duration is all about the application. And, you know, in our view, what defines long duration is the combination of two things. It's, a, it's, a, it's an application that's market driven, meaning there's a way to make money off of it. And there is, um, you know, there's a, there's a set of characteristics in that application where there's a divergence away from kind of conventional project economics, right? Where, you know, if you're trying to do, if you've got an application that demands six, 10, 12 hours of storage, um, you know, the, the regular rules of optimization around, you know, CapEx or LCOS or whatever it is don't necessarily apply. The reasonable answer to their question then is, you know, what factors define those boundaries? Well, you know, on the market side, it's typically regulation, you know, and, and, and what you see on the right hand side of the slide is, 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 an, is an extract from some of the UK rules around capacity markets. And basically what they say is, you know, anything over five and a half hours doesn't get you any incremental benefit. So that's a boundary, a regulatory boundary on, on, on what we would define as long duration storage for that particular application. On the economic side, typically what we, you know, the boundary that we see as defining what works and what doesn't for long duration storage is the effective cost of useful energy, right? It's, it's all well and good to optimize around, again, CapEx or LCOS or, you know, lifetime value or whatever it is, but you know, you, to the degree that you can, you're only getting additional benefit to the degree that you can actually take advantage of whatever capabilities the batteries are delivering. So with that context, you know, the, 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 the question that we would ask or the thing that we would propose is, you know, what opportunities are there that currently exist for long duration? And, you know, on to the next slide, you know, these are what we're looking at today in terms of the, the, the right opportunities for long duration. And the, the chart on the left is kind of a two by two matrix of how we think about our fit versus some of the incumbents. And, you know, this is a session on long duration, not high cycle. So I won't talk too much about the cycling side, but, you know, the, it, you know it's the combination of those two parameters together that from our view defines where our batteries are, are, are most valuable. But looking exclusively at sort of the, the duration part of that question, <clears throat> you know, there are a number of applications that we think make a lot of sense today that are where the duration that's required is in the range of about two and a half hours out to about 10 hours. And I think that's the, you know, the, that's the, the, the range in which the long duration uh, question makes the most sense today. Some of, the, some of the, the, the biggest applications that we spend most time looking at, first of all, is CNI solar plus storage, where you know, individual uh, electricity users, particularly sort of commercial facilities, industrial facilities, are self-generating their own electricity through solar. 
And then they want to take that self-generated generated electricity and deploy it in the most economically valuable time. So whether that's storing it and then deploying it in the evenings to fill in sort of uh, you know peak tariff periods, whether they're trying to you know fill a you know we look at a lot of industrial plants where they've got huge electricity loads in the morning when people come in and turn on industrial ovens and these kinds of things, sometimes setting very large demand charges on their bills. You know we want to be able to step in and be able to regulate that. Those are the sort of applications in CNI that make sense. And again, it's sort of four to six hours that seems to be the sweet spot for, for those kind of, that, that kind of work. Um, you guys uh, heard yesterday from, from Matt Allen from Pivot Power, who we're working with uh, uh, to develop a project at the Energy Super Hub Oxford, which is what we you know lump into the group of, of what we call grid services providers, right? These are uh, companies that are going out and deliver and de developing standalone storage projects to serve explicit problems on the electric grid and increasingly you know as Emily very rightly pointed out um you know whereas you know five or ten years ago you know seconds to minutes worth of regulation was required in order to make those profitable you know we now see that it's in that two and a half to five hour range that those grid services opportunities are really uh, are really most important so you know, if that's the long duration market in 2020, um, you know, the, the question that we're always asking ourselves, and 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 uh, that I want to spend sort of the rest of the presentation on is, you know, what does 2030 look like, um, and 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 how do we how do we think about, you know, if the, if these are the opportunities today, what are we going to want to do next? And I think the real answer is we don't know. You know, I have, I, I'm if I knew exactly what the electricity system was going to look like in 2030. Uh, you know, uh, I would uh, I, I would be I would be some sort of magician. What we can say, however, is what some of the specific characteristics of that market are going to be. And you know, I think that the given what's happened with the cost of renewable energy over the last couple of years, and given the you know the entire environmental and, uh, and sustainability imperative for going to a low carbon system, we can say for absolute certain that solar generation is going to be a huge part of the energy future. You know, it's all solar is already you know the cheapest form of electricity generation across two thirds of the world. You know, our view is that by 2030, the cost of installing new solar is going to be lower than the marginal cost, not the, the capital cost amortized, but the marginal cost of deploying and dispatching a conventional generating asset. At that point, there is no reason to dispatch those assets. And if that's true, you know, we've got a situation where, again, to the point that we made, we want to be able to take solar generation, we want to take that eight to ten hours of sun and we want to turn it into base load. We want to be able to deploy that 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 energy all through the night. In order to do that, we've got a couple of constraints. You know, we need to be able to meet that base load demand with those the, those dispatchable resources. So that 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 um, that um, you know sufficiency of supply question is absolutely critical. There's also the stability requirements, making sure that not only are we able to react sort of, you know, to, to, to changing loads, you know, within sort of minutes to hours, but also, you know, to macro level events when things like coronavirus hits and we all, uh, you know, the, the, the electricity loads change dramatically. How do you have sufficient flexibility in your electricity system? So that you're able to to respond appropriately while still maintaining that very low carbon um, aspect of the, the way the grid the grid is going to operate in general. So you know, with if those those things are true, uh, again we get to this question of well, yeah, but that's in 2030. How do we think about today the characteristics of long duration storage that we need in order to make that future vision a reality? And, and our view is that, again, it's an imperfect science, but what we can do is we can look to examples now of systems that have the kind of characteristics that our future electricity grid is going to need. And then, th and then, and then use that to define how we build storage for those kinds of applications. And the example that we look at most closely is dispatchable PV inside of remote microgrids. You know, in some ways, a, a micro you take the word off microgrid, off microgrid. You take, you know, it's it's just a grid. And if you know a future high penetration um, of solar on our electric grid is going to look very similar in terms of the characteristics that storage is going to need to have to pair with large scale PV generation. And when we look at modeling for a lot of these, you know, remote microgrid projects that are fundamentally using, you know, solar and storage to 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 provide all the power that's needed on site. You know, we constantly come across some very important drivers on the model. The first one is duration. You know, we don't see 10, 12, 14, 24 hours of duration 
as, as, as necessary because it ends up being the charge that is the most important part. You need to get all of the energy into your battery inside a uh, six to eight hour peak charging window inside the solar day in order to get that 24 hours of sufficiency you know, to, to, to run the entire site. So the power handling capability or the duration of the storage needs to be defined on that charge time. Typically, we see that you know the storage energy is about three times the PV power. I mean, this is obviously varies on you know the insulation in certain regions. And if you sort of think about twenty-two, you know, two thousand kilowatt hours per kilowatt installed per year, you know, you get to somewhere around that three to one ratio as an optimization to make sure that you're that you're getting sufficient storage into the battery, but you're not overpaying for that capacity. Part of that, making sure that you're not overpaying, is 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 optimization for battery throughput. You know, we've run these optimizations to look at well, how do we, you know, how do we, uh, you know, optimize around uptime? How do we optimize around, you know, using every solar uh, kilowatt hour? How do we run an optimization based on well, we don't care if we clip solar, we're just going to generate as much as possible. It all comes back to optimization of the throughput through the battery. How do we make sure that we're charging it, you know, as fully as possible on, a, on an average day and then making sure that the, the overall PV system is optimized to, to, to give you that charge and dispatch capability. Um, the final one that we, that, we, that, that we see a lot is the a low environmental impact of incremental storage duration. And obviously the reason we think about this a lot is because we think it's one of the major differentiators about our product. If you take a five hour lithium system and turn it into a 10 hour lithium system, holding power constant, you've just doubled your environmental footprint. With a full battery, if you do that same step, your incremental environmental footprint is zero because the because the, the the electrolyte itself is totally recyclable and then finally the you know the, the 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 as i mentioned earlier you know in all of the modeling that we do having to come and do replacements over time on these battery technologies you know it, it not only destroys the economics of the project it destroys the financing models it destroys the o m models and so our view is that the battery life absolutely needs to be tied to the life of the generating asset. And if that's true, those things can be co-optimized and you can get a much more efficient overall solution. Uh, so to, to, to recap, um, you know, long duration in our view is an application, not a technology. And it's always going to be defined by markets and economics, not by you know, whose battery technology is underlying it. There are great businesses today that exist in long duration storage and we're, you know, we're currently serving those opportunities. Long duration is going to accelerate in a high solar future because, you know, whether that whether solar is 40% of our future grid or 80% of our future grid's energy, there's always going to be an imperative to take that energy and dispatch it into baseload. And the current work in high PV use cases, we believe, can guide our work. You know, what we want to do is we want to design the storage, not just the, the electrochemistry. We want to just define and design the products, the technologies, the regulation, the markets, the financing schemes um, that are going to, you know, today that are going to facilitate that long duration, high renewables future. And with that, I will hand over to Russ. Thanks, Matt. I'll pause a bit here as Solar Media brings up my presentation. So, uh, as indicated at the beginning, Russ Weed, I'm the Chief Development Officer for Aries uh, Advanced Real Energy Storage. I'll continue on the same topic, building a better uh, business case for long duration. And I'm going to uh, particularly focus on cost. Uh, and I'm going to go back and reference a particular item in Dr. Zhuk's presentation that may have been a little abstract and, and draw it out, which is he, he noted that one of the projects has, and that's Nantucket, has a BCR, a benefit cost ratio of 1.55. So the benefits are 1.55 greater than the cost. So uh, in that equation, uh, your denominator, your cost is, is a key one. That's what I'm going to focus on here today. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, this is my profile for this conference. You can read it there, not here, of course. Short version is compared to most people, not including Dr. Zhuk and Mr. Harper here. I'm an energy storage veteran uh, approaching nine years now. Uh, uh, and during that time, uh, I have been involved with a variety of technologies 
and in 2018 uh, started a consulting firm that is working with a, a myriad of technologies and now I am the chief development officer for Aries, as I mentioned. So uh, my presentation keeps it pretty simple. Uh, so what do you need in terms of, of in order for long duration storage to be uh, viable, to be feasible, I would summarize as you need four things. You need low cost, you need durability, uh, and those two together uh, drive uh, having a low cost of ownership. There have been a number of questions during the course of the presentations talking about uh, uh, comparing CapEx versus levelized cost uh, or uh, total cost of ownership, uh, which I affectionately refer to as TACO, total cost of ownership. Uh, I agree that the, the the levelized cost, the total cost over the life of the project is is a key factor and therefore durability comes into place. So is this a three year life technology or a 40 year life? It makes a huge uh, difference in the BCR calculation. Also, of course, you need scale in order to achieve low cost. And uh, as Matt uh, spoke to, it must be reliable uh, because the costs of maintenance costs of repairs and so forth must be low, else it destroys your pro forma. So to the end of uh, having a low cost, long duration energy storage technology, uh, Aries would submit that uh, the lowest cost is zero and uh, gravity is such a zero cost commodity. Uh, also quite useful in these times uh, where there's a focus on uh, supply chains due to disruptions because of macro events uh, and also national economic interests. Uh, the availability of local resources and free resources is a key factor. Also in this slide, you'll see the key number, uh, which is the acceleration caused by gravity. And uh, if this is not something that you have thought about recently, uh, maybe at some point uh, in your schooling, but not recently, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think about it. In one second, uh, the Earth pulls us towards it almost 10 meters. So well, that's a very strong force. And if you can harness that force, it will yield you the low cost that is necessary for long duration storage. Here is a very simple schematic. If you do your gravitational potential energy calculation, and down in the lower right-hand corner there, you'll see a, a very a quick calculation uh, that backs up this. Uh, it works out that, uh, uh, and of course, we have to convert uh, from metric uh, to the English slash American system uh, because the gravitational potential energy relies on, on the metric units. But if you do the math, you'll see that if you raise a approximately 330 ton, uh, English slash US ton, um, up a thousand feet, the work that is required to do so is 250 kilowatt hour and assuming 100% efficiency on the way down, which of course is not the case because you will have parasitics, uh, you have 250 kilowatt hour uh, potential energy in that one mass car, which has the weight indicated, which is about 330 tons. That's a pretty substantial amount of energy, 250 kilowatt hours, especially if you have, so imagine what the system could look like, especially if you have multiple mass cars and each one of those at the end of a thousand feet at that weight, uh, you have 250 kilowatt hours uh, after charging going up the hill can be discharged going down the hill, the slope, I should say. Uh, and here's also how you can see that it would look. Now you see a single track here. Uh, I've already mentioned that if you uh, augment the mass cars, you will be building up your energy capacity. Uh, you can also do so by having multiple tracks right next to each other. 
So uh, you can actually uh, achieve a pretty strong energy density uh, from this uh, rail energy storage implementation. Now, uh, what you've seen so far are drawings or renderings. And uh, all of us on the conference here, Imra, Matt, and I, would tell you, uh, beware uh, uh, discussion of products uh, that is not sufficiently substantive. How's that for a nice way of putting it? Uh, now, in my experience over the years, you need six things in order to have a successful product. Yes, you need to have technology, but you also must have very good engineering. And often these two things are conflated and can lead to great problems for companies. Uh, you can have the best technology in the world, but if your engineering isn't sufficient, that is trouble, of course. Uh, same for manufacturing, and you must also have services and the finance and the people. So you must have all six of those things in order to have a successful product. And I would encourage the use of this schema to evaluate all uh, available energy storage solutions these days uh, from what is seen as the incumbent lithium uh, to flow to gravity storage. So on the technology side, uh, the technology foundation for gravity storage is gravity. And, uh, and, and let us all be, uh, you know, uh, let us all be helped if this equation ever changed. Uh, so that's the foundation of the technology. Uh, and then specifically rail technology, because rail is so much uh, more effective at weight bearing than crane. Uh, that was mentioned earlier. So rail technology and Aries has a patent portfolio uh, based on rail energy storage uh, with quite strong uh, and broad claims. Then as mentioned, however, uh, technology is not sufficient. Uh, you must uh, have the engineering. This shows a couple engineering uh, drawings showing the motor drives uh, that power the system. And uh, here uh, showing interconnection. Uh, and a pretty unique thing about this gravitational uh, storage uh, solution is that it provides inertia. And now I want you to see, please, an animation of how the Aries system would work. In this case, a 50 megawatt project in Nevada that uh, is on the verge of having ground broken.
So that will give you a view of how this system will look when installed. As mentioned, groundbreaking is imminent. Please stay tuned. Thanks for your interest in long duration storage as we continue to build the industry. Well, Matt and uh, Russ, uh, thank you for your presentations. And we have perhaps a few minutes for either discussion or questions. Uh, if you look at your panels, there were a number of questions for Matt, I believe. Uh, Matt? Sure. Um, I am starting from the top. Uh, there's a question uh, from, from Pedro Mendez. Uh, it seems that each photo from the photo of each battery is uh, connected to each individual array. What is the advantage or reason to do so? Um, so you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, in this particular application that you're, or this particular site that you're talking about, we have done what we and others refer to as DC coupling of the battery and uh, the storage, the solar array together. Um, you know, essentially the advantage of that is that you are able to take DC power directly from the PV array and charge the battery without incurring the conversion losses of converting that over to an AC bus and then converting it back to DC in the battery itself. Um, there are uh, there are definitely applications where you would want to do that. It's not always the best way to go. And and for example, uh, you know, I would use the example of uh, rem you know the remote microgrid application for example for, for example where having all of those systems integrated together on an AC bus actually gives you a lot more flexibility that you can make use of in in, in having the overall system operate. So DC coupling can be beneficial. It can save some of the efficiency losses embodied in a system like this, but it depends on the project characteristics, whether it's the right way to go. Um, there, was a, there was a question um, from uh, Mr. Yavuz about um, internal support Supply chain for society projects. Um, the, no, it was a series of questions, um, you know, related to you know some of the recent news about Vanadium flow batteries, uh, especially between you know, the development that Schmidt um, is doing in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, the outlook for v for VRBs is you know grows in stature every time there is an, an announcement like this. And you know, while I of course would like that to announcement have been for our company. You know, this really is a case of the rising tide floats all boats. You know, we are not, vanadium flow batteries are not in competition with one another. We're in competition with some of the bigger incumbents. And so news like this is phenomenal news for our entire industry. In terms of the ability to build an internal supply chain in Saudi Arabia for vanadium based on uh, secondary production from spent catalysts, um, I, I can't speak to exactly what they're planning to do. I have no knowledge of what they're planning to do, but I will say that production from spent catalysts and other sort of secondary processes out of the oil industry uh, is a, is potentially a, a massive source of vanadium. Um, you know, we source uh, we have in the past sourced uh, vanadium electrolyte from. Um, from fly ash, uh, you know, which is a, which is one of those those waste materials. Um, and if you think about sort of the the environmental footprint of the, the recyclability question, um, obviously taking something that is an industrial waste and turning it into you know a useful battery for you know decarbonizing the grid, that's a that's a phenomenal story. So I, I think they will definitely be looking at that internal supply chain. Um, there is so uh, we've got another question. If I, if I, I'm happy to keep cruising through these, but please stop me. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Um, so we've got a question from um, from uh, from Paul Molta. Um, given the low ridership efficiency due to the high auxiliary loads, have you developed a rule of thumb for upsizing PV? Um, we haven't developed a rule of thumb. Look, at, a lot of it re you know, relies on um, the site characteristics, right? And, and I would say that uh, while we do have auxiliary loads that don't exist in other systems, uh, to call those high as a blanket statement, I think is 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 inappropriate. 
Um, you know, I recently visited one of the biggest lithium ion installations in the US in a place called Imperial Valley. And it's a very small building filled with batteries, filled with, uh, you know, surrounded by a giant array of air conditioners. And, you know, th those air conditioners are uh, parasitic loads, just like everything else in a, in, a, in a battery system like this. In our case, we don't need that air conditioning, right? We operate up to 45 or 50 degrees C without additional cooling built in. Um, and so because of that, yes, okay, there are pumping loads, but there are no air conditioning loads. How do you trade those off of one another? It comes down to how often are you using the battery? What are the ambient conditions like? And 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 um, how are you optimizing the sort of the size of the battery versus what it's supposed to do? I'll just jump in and offer up some questions. Um, I think this was for Dr. Uh, Duk. What's the future of supercapacitor storage, and can it be compared with lithium-ion batteries? Uh, supercaps generally are very short duration batteries. They are power batteries, not energy batteries. So you can use them for something like harbor cranes, uh, but you cannot really use them for uh, substantial loads that you need to uh, maintain for long periods. So super caps, short duration. If I could add to that also, Maria, super caps can be useful to augment the response time of various technologies. When I say augment, I make I mean make them faster. Yeah. One of the big advantages of super caps is that they they can do very many cycles. So their lifetime is very good. If I can if I can maybe jump in and, and combine two seemingly popular questions together, um, Terry Pearls and Matt Ziedler are asking, you know, very much the similar similar themed questions. You know, why do we focus on capital costs rather than the twenty to thirty year economic impact? Um, and and what should be included in that economic that overall sort of total life cycle cost? Look, I absolutely agree that that what you're that, that we should be looking at those 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 long run costs because the viability of long duration storage is all about you know the the cost of delivering you know individual kilowatt hours over the life of the product uh, over the life of the project and um, you know maintenance costs absolutely need to be part of that disposal costs absolutely need to be part of that so you know to look at to look at it just the, the you know the capital cost of putting a battery in place I think absolutely misses the point. In terms of optimizing, um, optimizing storage for actual commercial applications on the electric grid. A couple the trouble comments. Is, uh, Go ahead. The trouble is, however, that when you are trying to sell a storage device, uh, what people look at first is the capital cost. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, ma many of these arguments, like why do we need 135 uh, days of storage? Uh, you know, those are idealized and those are very useful questions from the point of view of planning the future of energy storage. But when you're actually out there in the marketplace, uh, you have to convince somebody to buy your technology. And then you have to reduce it to things like lowering the capital costs, <clears throat> slowly going up the, in the duration time, uh, and uh, generally catering to uh, a lower target than you would uh, if you were just talking to idealized uh, people. So I, let me, yeah, let me throw a couple comments in there. So um, first one is uh, as a target, I, I wrote this in the answer to a question, as a target, I believe the industry should aim for, on a TACO, total cost of ownership basis, uh, which does not include the cost of energy, uh, uh, bracket that out in order to compare apples to apples. Uh, we should be aiming for uh, less than five cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, it may seem, uh, when you look at some of the projects that have been announced, uh, Imra touched on SEEs, 
announcement last week of the 770 megawatts. You know, there's other large ones that have been announced, you know, SCAPA, LADWP. But uh, be careful on the calculations because uh, uh, on the face of it, the cost of the storage in, in, in that for that uh, PPA appears uh, to be something like a cent and a half. And, you know, which is great compared to five cents. But the numerator denominator aspect again, uh, the denominator, if you divide by the output, the throughput of the storage in that deal, it's not a cent and a half, it's six and a half cents. And that's with a COD several years away. Uh, so I think that's a, a target for us as an industry. And uh, the second point, which I touched on, which is, you know, Look closely at those formula. Uh, look closely at that pro forma. Matt and and Imra were mentioning uh, recycling and reuse. Um, when you're looking at a storage uh, project pro forma, are there lines in there for the costs associated with that? Are there lines in the pro forma associated with degradation? Uh, and those numbers are going to be much different for lithium than they are for a gravity storage system with a 40-year life. Uh, and no degradation of gravity, uh, and also uh, much different than the, the degradation uh, and cost of a flow battery. So those are my two points. Five cents, and look at that pro forma closely. Yep, important to keep in mind. You're muted, Maria. Thank Still muted. Um, they're at the very, they're You're at the good. very top. Oh, can you hear me? We can now. Thank you. Now we can. Matt, I know that you answered it in the chat, but there are some questions about the commissioning of the Nevada project. Can you talk a little bit about that pilot? Okay, so you mentioned. said Matt. You meant Russ. Um, oh, so sorry, yes, Russ. Yeah. no problem. Uh, so. Uh, the uh, animation was uh, for a project in Nevada. There's publicly available uh, records on where that project is. It's in the Clark and Nye County area. Uh, the the timeline for uh, being you know, completion of delivery, being interconnected and online, as I indicated in the note there, is Q4 2021. And uh, you, you could fairly say to me, given my other question or my other comments, so Q4. Uh, the reason to, to use a three-month period is because of the interconnection, as I know everyone in your various projects has encountered uh, the, the, the uh, challenges of the interconnection are very often part of the project. And in the case uh, for the Nevada project, uh, we have a commitment from the utility for the interconnection to be up and available uh, by the end of the year, but we are hopeful of 2021. We, we are hopeful that that will be somewhat earlier, thus the Q4 2021 COD. Thanks for the uh, question. And then one more question that can be open to everyone. I'm just going to mute anyone else. Um, from your experience, what's the appetite for international developers? And they are specifically asking for South Africa, but what about the international appetite for development in general? Um, this can be for all three of you for the final question. I have some background on this. I could answer if, if you'd like, or you can, Matt. Um, you go first. So uh, as you may note from my background, uh, I was... Uh, uh, part of uh, the flow battery UET, the flow battery company UET, Uni Energy Technologies, and uh, South Africa was a, a particular market of interest. Uh, working with colleagues, and so the answer is yes. Uh, Eskom, as a, uh, a large utility and a, a large customer. Uh, is quite attractive, and there are various uh, development efforts you know, with equivalent bodies uh, to the XM Bank in the United States that are quite involved. And um, I'll hand it over to you, Matt, because I believe that uh, capital from South Africa, namely from Bushfeld, this was all publicly announced, uh, uh, helped make it possible for the Avalon Red T merger resulting in, in, in Invinity. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds really true. Um, 
you know, Bushveld has been a big part of our story for the last 18 months or so, and, and we're, they were key to making this happen. And, and because of that relationship, we spent a lot of time looking at projects in South Africa. Yeah, I think the, the opportunity there is that there is, a, you know, there's some huge challenges on the electric grid, but at the same time, it's a very, you know, the economic fundamentals and the technical fundamentals of working that country, in that country are very, very strong. Um, you know, the, the thing that I think is, is missing is, you know, appropriate um, regulation and appropriate funding structures around those projects. Um, and, and I think if those, if, those, if those components fall into place, you know, we're, we're really excited about the opportunities there. And especially with a, a strong partner with, uh, with Bushveld Energy in country, um, you know, we're, we're, we're excited to see those things come into place and, and uh, be able to address those opportunities as they arise. All right, and Still with that, um, I'll, I'll ask for Wait. final thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to put this into a somewhat larger perspective. Energy storage as a scientific endeavor has always been international. Uh, people from countries around the world have contributed to the development of batteries and storage technology in general. It's also an international marketplace. Uh, materials are sourced from around the world. Uh, it's something which we have to do together. And considering that we are talking about the future, the global warming situation, uh, the energy future, which is crucial for the well-being of people, uh, it behooves us to continue to keep this as an inter in an international framework. Uh, and I see energy storage having a great future as an international uh, endeavor. Here, here. Here, here. And uh, hope you don't mind, Imra. I want to point to you as an important factor in that internationalization, though I doubt you are getting on the airplane much these days. I know over your 20 years of helping build up the energy storage industry, that has not only been in North America, it has been globally. So thank you, sir, for everything that you've done for the industry and are continuing to do. It has been a pleasure. I'd like to thank all of the participants today. Thank you very much for the discussion. We've had really good interactions from the audience. Um, so thank you. And we hope to see you at our next session, uh, which will be tomorrow morning. It is our Beyond Lithium panel at 10 a.m. British summer time. And it will be followed by other sessions. So make sure to visit our website and see the updated agenda. But thank you again to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Imra. Thanks, Matt.